verse now. Jesus goes on to say that on these two commandments hang all of the law and all of the prophets. What Jesus is saying here is that the 16 and the 613 commandments that make up the Old Testament, he's saying that none of them are less important. What he is saying is they are summed up here. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. The God whom you have never seen. How do you show the love that you have for God? Why? By loving what God loves. Loving your neighbor as yourself. In this Matthean version of Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, Jesus then goes on to press the Pharisees, saying, let's get this all out in the open. You were looking for a Messiah. What do you think of the Messiah? In essence, Jesus is asking them a double-sided question. What do you think of the one that is coming to save the chosen people? Really, what he is asking is, what do you think of me? The Pharisees, perhaps a bit taken back at this assault, uh, respond that he is the son uh, as a descendant of our great leader, King David. Jesus, then claiming his lordship as the one sent from God, the one who is indeed greater than even David, asks them to explain this passage. How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls the Messiah Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit close to me until I make your, your enemies uh, your footstools under your feet. Jesus is asking the Pharisees, the keepers of the law, how do you explain that David called his own descendant greater than he is? Isn't David the patriarch? The ancestor? Hmm. There were probably three or even four generations of notable Bach musicians before the great Johann Sebastian Bach. These were musicians who made their living as musicians. They had names and they had reputations. But no serious musician will argue that in the person of Johann Sebastian, a depth of musicality and technicality and spirituality emerged that has left his legacy secure as the musician of musicians in the Bach family line. According to musicologists, his musical children and his musical ancestors would bow to Bach's ability to summon the sense of worship and joy in his music to his mastery. And Bach would sign every piece that he wrote, Solo Dei Gloria, which means for God alone. The great German theologian Martin Luther was born in 1453. His father was a businessman and a council member. Luther's father was successful, and he wanted his elder son Luther to be successful. His aim was to send young Luther to law school. But Luther had a spiritual encounter with God that turned his sights toward the priesthood. Martin Luther was an avid student and earned a doctorate in theology. However, his learning drove him to take his beloved Catholic church to task. Like the Apostle Peter, Luther, after prayer and much study, was convinced that the followers of Jesus Christ were justified not by works, as we read in the book of James, but by faith. The idea of having to confess your sins to another human being or actually paying the church so that it would grant you indulgences or pardons so that you could come to the Lord's table became so intolerable to him that he protested the Catholic Church with the 95 Theses and the Protestant Reformation was born. Religious freedom had its genesis. This 
need to get to God without having to have permission was unleashed. The idea of being able to wrestle and to question and to express some confusion and some doubt with the concepts of God and trust that you will not be shamed in public like some students we might know in their first semester of seminary had its genesis. We observe and celebrate that movement toward religious freedom this weekend, this yesterday and today. Michael Lewis King Jr. was born in 1929 in Birmingham, Alabama. His father, Michael Lewis King Sr., was a Baptist preacher. In 1934, the senior Dr. King took a trip to Berlin to attend the Fifth Baptist World Alliance. Dr. Michael King Sr. was so moved and so taken by Martin Luther's theology of free thinking and free access to a trusting, trustworthy God who welcomed you with all of your questions and misgivings, even as he came from a race of people who were downtrodden. He was so taken by how each human, as King David knew, had access to the movement of the Spirit of God, a theology voiced five centuries before he came on the scene, that upon returning to America, Dr. Michael Lewis King Sr. changed his name and the name of his middle child, Michael Lewis King Jr., to Martin Luther King in honor of the great reformer and theologian. Thus, as a child, Martin Luther King Jr. was anointed, dedicated, and destined at the shrine of another great theologian to perhaps be the greatest in his family line, even greater than his father, as he pursued freedom for all of us. So, what is the Wesleyan quadrilateral? <laughs> it is a four-sided system of approaching theology. Bible, tradition, experience, and reason. Very logical. Very Pharisaic. Of course, Mr. John Wesley, very Methodist. Perhaps what those who so strongly adhere to this formula might add is a fifth piece to which Jesus bids us claim. Bible with its 613 commandments, tradition, the faith of our fathers and mothers, that is the way we have always done it, it's good enough for me. Experience, I've been in a lot of churches and i found that this works best. Reason, let's try to respect each other and make sense of the situation. To that quadrilateral, Perhaps a fifth side might be added, turning it into a pentagon. The transforming, sometimes frightening, and unsettling movement of the Holy Spirit. That professor, Dr. Connie Frazier, who attempted to kid with me or shame me in front of my classmates, later wrote in a marvelous essay on peacemaking, she wrote, John Wesley recognized the importance of intentionally forming and honoring relationships that crossed old boundaries, not a suspension of difference, not pretending that difference doesn't exist, but the, free, the freedom and liberation of inclusion of difference mediated by the Holy Spirit in hope, love, and peace. It is in that fifth peace Bible, tradition, experience, reason, and the movement of God's Holy Spirit that propels us forward as it did Jesus, 
that reminds us that we are not just the observers of the law, but you and I, as Jesus was, we are the fulfillers of the law. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law, to turn often mother against daughter and father against son. You and I, through the Spirit, must try laws, ply laws, as in badger them, badger with them, wrestle with them, and then stretch them out to their ultimate conclusions, conclusions that perhaps our forefathers never saw as we follow God. Jesus said, greater things than I do shall you do through the Spirit. We are reminded that God's church, at the Spirit's urging, is always, always, always in reformation. Would you pray with me? God, this is not the church of our parents or our grandparents or our great-grandparents, but it is your church moving ever forward, careering this way and that, innovating, changing, rejoicing. Help us to realize that as religious freedom has been granted to us, as its stewards, we must continue to make space and place for those who come after us to even be greater, as your son taught us. It is in his name we pray. I invite you.